This film employs dramatic reenactments. All words spoken by actors are exact quotations drawn from the interviews, journals, and the memoirs of those who fought. Documents are still mostly secret, but this much is known about the germ warfare attack on Winnipeg, Manitoba, at the height of the Korean War. A Canadian Forces aircraft approaches Winnipeg from the west, riding towards the city on a strong wind. Aboard are agents of the United States Army Chemical Corps. Together with Canadian germ warfare scientists, they are about to conduct a covert biological warfare experiment on a civilian population. The aircraft releases an aerosol, a chemical compound designed to make it difficult for people to breathe. The population is unaware. City officials have been lied to, told the operation is simply an experiment with invisible smoke screens. In fact, what is being tested is how best to infect an entire city with disease from the air. A similar experiment is conducted on San Francisco, all part of a massive secret project to develop offensive biological weapons for the Korean battlefield. There is a mystery about the Korean War, still unsolved more than half a century later. Unable to defeat China and Korea on the battlefield, did the United States undertake a clandestine campaign and use biological weapons to spread disease among the Chinese and Korean population? The investigation of this mystery changed the life of Canadian historian Stephen Endicott, and especially his missionary parents. My father and my mother had gone to China in 1952 to revisit the country where they had been missionaries for 25 years. They went at the invitation of the Chinese Prime Minister, Mr. Zhou and I. While they were there, which was in January, February, March, 52, the Premier's office called, said, would you like to go and check into what's happening up in the Northeast? Endicott arrives to find Chinese medical and sanitation teams, apparently in the middle of a campaign to stop the spread of some terrible diseases. The Chinese claim that plague, encephalitis, and anthrax are appearing in places where they'd long been eradicated or never seen before. The reported outbreaks are widely scattered. All across the map of North Korea and Northern China, through the first months of 1952, more and more cases are claimed and reported to Endicott Sr. The most fearsome pathogen was anthrax because it was refined so that it could be inhaled, breathed in, and affect the lungs. And this, this was incurable. Endicott's father came to believe that something sinister was unfolding. The Chinese claimed outbreaks were happening after strange bombs were found on the ground. Found, they said, after US planes made low-level bombing runs. The bombs were apparently designed to carry propaganda leaflets. The Chinese claimed that no leaflets were found, but that they did discover feathers, rats, 
and different types of insects, all infected with virulent diseases. The most startling were infected flies, supposedly found on winter's snow. He went in the rural areas. He talked to people who claimed that they had seen these uh, carriers come down. He talked to scientists who had examined the carriers uh, as to what uh, diseases they carried. He was impressed by the credentials of these scientists, their credentials in Western medicine. Many of them had been graduates of Cambridge and uh, Oxford and uh, even of the University of Toronto. I came to the Northeast and interviewed the public health authorities and people of all walks of life. I have seen all kinds of incriminating evidence of American germ warfare. After seeing all this evidence, I know that the American government has carried out large-scale germ warfare on the Chinese mainland. A respected United Church minister, Endicott's father comes back to Canada to find his evidence dismissed as communist propaganda. In the Canadian Parliament, the government denounces him as a subversive and even considers charging him with treason, the penalty for which is death. There was quite an uproar in Canada, and the press were declaring him to be a, a public enemy number one. While a propaganda war and possibly a biological war is underway, the conventional war in the Korean mountains becomes a struggle of giants in the last months of 1951. At the front, the Chinese army is in crisis. The army is hiding between battles and cave complexes to escape US firepower and still taking tremendous casualties. Their desperate situation is not being understood by the communist leadership. Kim Il-sung, the North Korean dictator, wants the Chinese to keep attacking the US-led forces at any cost. General Peng, the Chinese commander, believes this is a suicidal strategy. Military historian Bin Yu says Peng took his case to the top. Peng personally returned to Mao and argued with Mao, and Mao uh, believed him and, and you know, listened to him and then realized that the world could be uh, one of attrition and it could last much longer. Mao accepts the bad news, but orders one more big assault on the U.S.-led forces to strengthen China's hand in negotiations. The Chinese strategy calls for another massive assault to try and break through the United Nations line in the mountains defending the South Korean capital of Seoul. In the autumn of 1951, snow has come early to the Korean hills, making Canada's UN brigade feel right at home. Captain Charlie Forbes has a premonition trouble is coming. Soldiers have what we call a sixth sense. I've lived it. All soldiers in the battlefield smell things up. They know when to bend down, they know when to duck. The Canadians are part of a United Nations force defending Hill 355, called Little Gibraltar for the manner it dominates the Western Front. The Americans are atop the hill, with the Canadians on the next ridge. The Chinese, they were trying to gain Hill 355. At the, at the gain Hill 355, they had, a, they had a dominating position tactically and strategically. 1,500 hours, the 22nd of November. The Chinese army advances toward Hill 355. Grid position, nine 
Charlie Zero, Forbes commands seven, a platoon three, equipped with mortars, five. which are bullseye accurate against massed position, enemy troops position. as far as seven kilometers away. Seven, one, two, charge, four. We had just finished recalling the zero lines of our mortars. In other words, we were prepared to fire. My mortar fire controller, Sergeant Zaluski, Walter Zaluski, calls me. Niner, Niner, Niner. Target, 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 scale 20. I said, Walter. Are you out of your fucking mind? Scale 20 is 20 rounds per mortar per minute. That's 120 rounds a minute. Yes, yeah, six mortars. He said, sir, there's three rows. Then he speaks to me in French, you know, and swears. There are three rows of Chinese rolling on towards us at 355. Rows of Chinese. I said, Amen. He said, please fire. Fire! Then he came back, he said, oh, the dead dog, beautiful. He said, repeat. Repeat. Fire! With fire from Forbes' mortar platoon, the Canadian line holds. But on Hill 355, the Chinese assault causes the American defense to suddenly and unexpectedly begin to buckle. Here on the radio, collapse, 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 this is collapse. Over. We all look at each other and I look at the radio operator. Unknown code word. Collapse, collapse. And we hear this loud and clear. It must have been on the American net. Then we get a report from Alpha Company down below. The Americans are abandoning 355 and they're running to minefield. At their mortar position, Forbes and his men see a drama unfolding in no man's land. I saw with my binoculars one of the most uh, uh, poignant, uh, 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 tense moment in war. There's a big American fellow uh, with his gear, uh, rifle and everything, who had ran across a minefield and had blown a leg. At the Canadian line, a corporal skilled at landmines volunteers to try and rescue the American. Corporal Berlinger. He was built like a bear. He wasn't very, very, very tall, but he had shoulders about that, that wide and big, strong arm, you know. The typical lumberjack, you know, I could see him. There was snow, about four inches of snow. How do you walk through a minefield with trip wires and everything? And this is what I call the tense moment. With my binoculars, I watched everything, and I saw him one foot at a time, putting his hand down, feeling with his hand, then putting his right foot where the hand was, then he would move again. Must have been about 50, 60 steps, but every one of them was like, a, as if they were, they were shoving a bayonet in your heart. Because I, I said, sure, I said, it's going to blow up. This is not the kind of thing that you want to see happen. You, when it, it has happened, you do what you have to do. But now you want to prevent it. How do you prevent that? You can't prevent that. He has decided he would go. He's not going to let the other man die there. And when he finally reaches him, he grabs him, the fireman's uh, 
tackle you know a big huge man oh. and he leans down puts him over his back and he's got him astride his shoulder you can see his legs are bent he must have weighed 200 pounds for sure he's holding him with one hand then he leans down and grabs the American's rifle. It's something that's uh, unbelievable, but that's true. He turns around, pivots around in the same place, and comes back on the same steps. OK, he's coming back. <laughs> that's courage like i never seen before. Puts him down. And all the Americans can say is, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was it. Caporal Berlinguer. I don't think he ever, ever, ever got a decoration, a mention in dispatch or anything like that. Unbelievable. But that's part of the war. Nineteen-month-old war goes on being fought. In icy weather, Republic of Korea infantrymen support the tank probe of communist strong points. By holding the line, the Canadians set the stage for a U.S. counterattack, taking Hill 355 back from the Chinese. A red position is hit. The tank blasts it again. The battle is symbolic of the larger war. Both sides going for victory, the UN Army but neither side its job. able to land the day and knockout. The day-out hammering of the red enemy. Day and night, the U.S. keeps up a relentless bombing campaign of Chinese and North Korean positions. But it is no longer a free fire zone for American pilots. The Chinese now boast 4,000 planes and almost overnight have become the third largest air force in the world. With the help of Soviet pilots and the latest Soviet MiG jets, the Chinese begin to shoot down more and more American planes. In the wreckage of the planes and from shot down pilots, the Chinese and North Koreans are looking for a smoking gun. More evidence that the US is employing biological warfare. In the spring of 1952, they stage a press conference that startles the world. A navigator from the U.S. Air Force's 3rd Bomb Wing becomes the first of 25 U.S. flyers to make a detailed confession on germ warfare. Kenneth Enoch claims his U.S. Yeah, operational training began at a U.S. To... base in Japan with a lecture on delivery warfare. systems. Firstly, by dropping the germs by themselves, or secondly, by dropping germs with insects, Thirdly, by dropping animals to carry the germs and the insects. They should be employed at the low air speeds and low altitudes to avoid damage to the insects. When pilots were shot down and uh, the Chinese interrogators talked to them, they told them, you better tell us what you did. And if you tell us what you did, you will be treated uh, leniently. Then the only other instruction I received, of course, was the order to carry out my germ warfare mission. They were just sent back and back again to write more. What were your targets? What were your bomb loads and so forth? My germ mission took place on the 27th of March, 1952. At 6.45, I went out to my airplane <coughs> to check it over. As I was out there, I noticed the men loading the bombs on it. <coughs> and they were in the uniform as uh, he had described them to us. In the white fatigues, the mask, and the gloves. <coughs> These men took the bombs out of this closed truck and loaded them by hand. 
In Washington, the administration and the military find themselves on the defensive. The US repeatedly denounced the charges as communist propaganda, with General Ridgway leading the attack. On the whole black record of false propaganda, these charges should stand out as a monumental warning to the American people and to the free world. A warning as menacing and as urgent as a forest fire bearing down upon a wooden village. While the U.S. is in damage control, in Canada, the federal security police try to discredit James Endicott by proving he is a Communist Party member. Finally, they admit he is not. Stephen Endicott never forgets the attacks on his father, and after becoming an historian, sets out to get to the bottom of the germ warfare story. From newly declassified documents, Endicott discovers that during the Korean War, while U.S. denials are emphatic in public, behind the scenes, a top secret biological warfare program is in fact underway. This declassified U.S. Army film shows that the U.S. became serious about biological and chemical weapons as far back as the, the Second World War. When the gas warfare phase comes, it will produce tremendous casualties on the enemy and at the same time prevent excessive casualties to our own troops. By the end of Good the luck. Second World War, the biological warfare program is second in size and secrecy only to the Manhattan Project that developed the A-bomb. When the Second World War ended, the U.S. discovered that their Japanese enemy also had an advanced biological warfare program. It turned out the germ warfare experiments performed on animals by the Allies had been performed on Allied prisoners of war by the Japanese army in the most gruesome fashion. While they were still alive, they would cut them open and observe what happened to the various organs as a result of this infusion of disease, the liver, the kidneys, the heart, the lungs. Terrible, terrible torture. When General MacArthur makes a deal to keep the emperor in place, Japanese germ warfare experts are also secretly protected. Lieutenant General Shiro Ishii, commander of the Japanese germ warfare program, turns his research over to the United States in exchange for immunity from prosecution as a war criminal. The deal was top secret, justified by the war on communism and the hunt for a perfect weapon. The attraction of uh, biological warfare for the American military was that uh, biological weapons would not destroy the infrastructure of an enemy. And this would mean that the post-war reconstruction would be much simpler. An atomic weapon wipes out everything. A biological weapon just wipes out people. And so the buildings, the railways, the factories, and everything else would be there. Endicott discovers that during the Korean War, biological warfare became a $350 million operation, with biological weapons raised to the same level as the atomic bomb, strategic category number one. On the 21st of December, 1951, with the war deadlocked, the military is secretly told it is time that actual readiness be achieved. To do that, U.S. military researchers adapt a technique the Japanese successfully field tested, using insects, rats, and feathers to spread plague, encephalitis, and anthrax. To get the feathers and insects to a target, the U.S. tests a 500-pound bomb designated M105, designed for delivering propaganda leaflets. This declassified photo shows how the 500-pound M105 leaflet bomb becomes a feather bomb. In his investigation, Stephen Endicott goes to the North Korean capital of Pyongyang, looking for connections between the recently declassified documents and bombs the North Koreans say were filled with infected insects and feathers. This is the leaflet bomb, the four-compartment leaflet bomb. Apartments are out of here, but they're in that one. 
M105. So the M105 was the leaflet bomb that was converted as a bacteriological bomb. And uh, that number, this bomb appears in the U.S. Air Force mission reports. So this is one of their main biological weapons. And the, the vectors, whether leaf, uh, leaves or insects or cotton, were packed in here. And then the, the insects, the infected insects, would be released when the leaflet bomb uh, broke open. While charges of biological warfare are flying, the peace talks begin in earnest on the divide between North and South Korea at Panmunjom. Next, the move to Panmunjom. Americans have to learn to pronounce that name, then to understand the endless maneuvering. The snow was starting to pile up on the Korean front. Action was limited, and the negotiators worked out with a temporary break in the fighting, Canada's UN contingent has time for the kind of battle they are famous for. This one fought on a sparkling plain. New Zealand and Australian troops have challenged them to a hockey game on the Imjin River. When the Aussies and New Zealanders make their appearance on the ice, the Canadians know the Commonwealth Ice Championship is in the bag. The respite is short-lived. The war is soon back on, but the big movement of armies that characterized the struggle's first years is no longer happening. Now, the battlefield resembles a First World War no man's land. The armies dug in and fighting small, desperate engagements for a few hundred meters of terrain. Canada's Charlie Forbes, an artist as well as a soldier, paints his regiment's position during that melancholy time. War conditions in Korea, I think that particularly after they decided to stop the war, to, uh, to move into static positions at the 38th parallel, then it changed the mood completely. It was only night patrols, stand twos, 100% from midnight, from 8 o'clock in the evening until 6 o'clock in the morning. We lived in the ground like in 1914-17. There was no cellars to hide in. There was no wine. There was sake. But there were not very many bootleggers coming up front to sell us sake, you understand? And uh, it became, with, we were very lonely. On the Chinese side of the war, morale is also plunging. Discipline units are established to handle a growing crisis. Chinese soldiers deserting and pillaging the Korean countryside for food. On the UN side, in the final months of the war, Americans record a five-fold increase in desertions. A secret British report indicates that 90% of new casualties are self-inflicted wounds. And then uh, we started to have SIWs, self-inflicted wounds, which I never had in Germany, nor in France or uh, Holland and, and Belgium. Boys getting so lonely, 
He would hear a shot and he'd fire, uh, fire the rifle in the foot. It was not an epidemic, but it would happen and it would hurt. Then uh, we also had other, other cases, other cases of boys wanted to have a drink just to evade. But they would distill Preston, shoe polish to make alcohol. They would poison themselves. Found bodies lying around their trench, dead. So the leadership on the part of the officers and the uh, non-commissioned officers to keep the man's morale up uh, was a must. There was no action and it dragged. And the front line dragged. These men who were there, they wanted to fight. Rolando Hinojosa of the U.S. Army, a writer as well as a soldier, says the front became a twilight zone with insanity, a worse threat than the Chinese. Lieutenant Phil Brodke up and shot himself two days ago. We found his helmet, the binox, the paper, the pencil, two packs of cigarettes, a Japanese lighter, all in a row. We found him face down, half in, half out of his forward observation hole. He used to say he was a Philadelphia Jew doing time. For once he was wrong. He was a friend. He was resourceful and kind, calm, precise. And something that most of us here are not. He was very good at his job. And yet he cracked. As I imagine many of us will in time. Korea was a war of 1,000 days. A war that besides its enormous toll of human suffering was also demolishing the careers of the powerful. In Washington, President Harry Truman decides against running for another term. His Secretary of State writes that the Korean War has destroyed Truman's presidency. In 1953, it is clear no side is going to win the Korean War. General Dwight Eisenhower is the new American president. He's keeping an election promise to go to Korea and find a way to end the war. Just because one side wants peace doesn't make peace. We must go ahead and do things that induce the others to want peace also. To induce the others to want peace also, Eisenhower authorizes a show of force, a test of nuclear artillery, and a message that the U.S. is again ready to use the bomb to end the war. Joseph Stalin is dead. The In the Soviet Cold Union, Stone Joseph Did Stalin suddenly Moscow, dies, and with his death so comes a sea change in the world. The Communist support for an ongoing war in Korea fades. A dramatic change in Soviet policy. Now, with new Molotov leadership on both sides, foreign minister. peace negotiations After high level become more serious. Between Soviets and Chinese. The major obstacle is the autocratic South Korean president, Syngman Rhee. Behind the scenes, his presidency has become a reign of terror. Rhee is determined to sabotage any peace agreement that does not unite all of Korea under his rule. Winston Churchill, returned as British prime minister, reflects United Nations frustration in this telegram to Eisenhower. The following is only a thought of my own, he writes. Sigmund Rhee arrested or dismissed from office. And then the fighting stopped. This is Panmunjom, the place where they signed not a peace treaty, but a ceasefire. On the 27th of July, 1953, 
After three years of war and five million casualties, an armistice is drawn up freezing the Korean War in place. Both sides agree to stay where they were when the war started. The Chinese and North Koreans sign. The United States signs for the United Nations. But South Korean leader Syngman Rhee refuses, and for years, until he is overthrown, tries to keep the fires stoked for another move north. To this day, South Korea still is not party to the ceasefire. At the end of the fighting, there is an exchange of prisoners. The pilots who confessed to being part of a germ warfare program come back to the US and recant, saying they had been brainwashed. I did sign a confession relating to germ warfare, but the statements contained in this confession were false. They were obtained under duress from the Chinese communists. And if the pilot statements were made under I duress. So are their repudiations. We found that they had been threatened with court-martial in detail. And they wrote their uh, repudiations with that hanging over their heads. So that must moderate people's view of their repudiation of the confessions they made. In 1999, however, New evidence surfaces on the other side. Documents leaked from a Soviet archive allege that some evidence presented by the North Koreans had been faked. Soviet documents said they faked two cases, one of plague and one of cholera. They infected a couple of corpses. And this was to fool foreign visiting delegations. It's possible that uh, some people did fake something, but that doesn't take into account all the other places all over Korea where plague and anthrax and encephalitis uh, outbreaks were believed to have, have happened. Whether or not the Soviets and North Koreans faked some evidence, it seems clear that the Chinese believed that they were under biological attack during the Korean War. They initiated a massive decontamination and inoculation program. By April 1952, 20,000 medical workers inoculated 4,850,000 people against bubonic plague at the Korean front. I think it would be foolish or inefficient to commit yourself to something that uh, in large, such a large scale to immunize you know, your troops by such large numbers when if, if there's no compelling evidence to do such a diversion, you know, it, it took manpower, medical personnel to immunize a large number of troops. I'm now seeing that I totally believe the Chinese side. As a historian, of course, I have the Chinese background. Um, I tend to see the evidence. I, I tend to wait. I believe perhaps something more to come. The U.S. acknowledges that it used research from Japanese war criminals, that it spent $350 million on biological warfare, that it developed germ warfare as an offensive weapon during the Korean War, but it still denies actually using it on the battlefield. From still classified files, Endicott is confident the secret will one day be out. This is one of the, the deepest dark secrets of the Cold War, and it is a challenge to any historian to try to unearth uh, the truth of such a matter. At the end of the fighting, all sides claim victory. But there is a deep sense that nobody has won the Korean War. United Nations troops are shipped homeward. Charlie Forbes remembers coming back with the Canadians expecting to be honored by a grateful nation. They land first 
in Seattle. When we arrived in Seattle, there was a band. There were dancing girls. There were people coming around. That's typically American. When we came from out west, we stopped uh, in Calgary. There was Salvation Army at the station with coffee. Nobody else. We arriving in Canada, we were going to jump in everybody's arm. There wasn't a soul to, to, to welcome us. We arrived in Montreal, we were gathered in Montreal in a football field. All put together and, and then dispersed. No reception. Why would we be forgotten? Why should we be forgotten? The Canadians who are lying in Busan right now who are proud soldiers, good soldiers. Canadians are good soldiers. Why forgotten? They have come back. Canadian combat veteran John Bishop, Korean Canadians Ed and Myung Cook, U.S. Marine veteran Don Gill. They visit the United Nations Cemetery at Pusan, South Korea. Few of the Americans killed in the Korean War are buried here. Most were shipped home. Almost all of the 516 Canadians killed are here and are memorialized in a bronze by a Korean sculptor. While it commemorates people who died in the war, it shows love. I particularly like it that it doesn't glorify war. We feel that we are greatly indebted to these people, especially those who were killed. And without these uh, human soldiers, uh, South Korea wouldn't be what it is like today. No words really can express the gratitude. And uh, we feel very humbled to have uh, such support from foreign countries. We will never forget. Myung's father was one of one million South Korean civilians killed in the Korean War. The United States waged war in Korea without the consent of Congress, so it took decades for Washington to officially call it a war and build a memorial. This subdued tribute to the nearly two million Americans who served in the Korean theater and the 33,000 killed in action was finally dedicated in 1995. Still haunted by the war, the soldier poet Bill Childress imagined himself back there and saw a direct line from Korea to the horror that followed. North from Pusan, we dumbly followed leaders whose careers hung on victory. The road might have been the Appian Way, except for the starving children lining it. When we bivouacked near Pyeongtaek, a soldier fished a bent brown stick from a puddle. It was the arm of someone's child. Not far away, the general camps with his press corps. Any victory will be his. For us, there is only the long march to Vietnam. The Korean War reporter Marguerite Higgins died in the Vietnam War and as an honor is buried in the U.S. Capitol 
at Arlington National Cemetery. But Higgins left this startling and prophetic warning, written more than 50 years ago. We urgently need as many people on our side as possible. Since we're not a dictatorship and have to persuade rather than browbeat, it is up to America to prove by concrete acts that the people of the world have more to gain in siding with her. Until now, the two great oceans have protected Americans from the danger that war could land in their own backyard. Now, there is no safe place in the world. Within a matter of minutes, New York could become a more ghastly death trap than any frontline regimental command post. Fighting the United States to a standstill, China won recognition as a world power. But China's claim to having won the war is being challenged by China's own historians. China suffered more than one million wounded and dead. Not a picture of victory for historian Ben Yu. Other people question, uh, for instance, the, the casualty. You know, how could you claim victory? That uh, which large number of China, maybe twice or three times more casualties the Chinese suffered. Uh, if you measure a casualty Chinese, the, 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 the victory was very bitter. In North Korea, the war has never been forgotten. Here, war is religion. Those who fought the war are sanctified as idols. The war leader, Kim Il-sung, is worshipped as a god, a god who passed state power to his only begotten son, Kim Jong-il. Here, the regime keeps the people in constant fear that the war will start again. Outside Pyongyang, at a war museum in Sinchon province, the regime depicts its version of the Korean War, a version taught to every North Korean schoolchild for the last 50 years. On the walls, the US military is depicted committing war crimes. The images are caricatures, making this not so much a war museum as a hate museum. But behind the propaganda, there is a disturbing reality. Declassified documents now reveal that during the Korean War, a ruthless US policy coming from the top of the military deliberately targeted civilians. An estimated two million North Korean civilians, old men, women, and children, were killed in the war, mostly by US firepower, killed by gunfire and bombing, high explosive and napalm. It could have been and can still be even worse. The US began rehearsing nuclear attacks on North Korea in 1951, and as recently as 1998, the nuclear attack plan was still being practiced and refined. Regular air raid drills in Pyongyang today are a distraction from famine and repression, but also reflect a great fear of the United States. At the 38th parallel, South Korean armed forces, bolstered with a defense budget that exceeds the entire GNP of North Korea, patrol the impassable border under the direct command of the United States. The Pentagon still keeps a force of 37,000 US military battle ready near the front. But from the days that Charlie Forbes manned a post not far from here, there has been a momentous change at no man's land. 
the likelihood that North Korea has the atomic bomb raises the stakes. But there is hope. At the border, a new generation of democratic South Korean leaders, not anxious to resume the war, have built a gleaming train station, good propaganda, but also a symbol of good faith, ready if war jitters ever dissipate to take the first commuters from Seoul to Pyongyang. Across no man's land, the unfinished war will end either as a journey of reconciliation between North and South, or with a roar of tanks and rush of missiles signaling more war and the final act of the Korean tragedy. <laughs>